Welcome to Nevada and to the 2021 Art and Environment Season. The Nevada Museum of Art has organized five exhibitions to serve as the backdrop for land art, past, present, futures. John Franco Gorgoni, Land Art Photographs, features 50 of this Italian photographer's most iconic images of earthworks in the American West. From Michael Heiser and Walter Di Maria to Nancy Holt and Robert Smithson, Gorgoni was on the ground in the late 1960s to help bring these projects to life. For nearly two decades, the Nevada Museum of Art has considered what is next for land art. We've collected archives and artworks for our permanent collection that look deeply at iconic earthworks. We've asked, who are the voices that have been left out of this dialogue? And what artists are critiquing the genre's most iconic artworks? We've worked with and commissioned artists who see land as part of a larger system. And we've acknowledged those who have known this and fought for this all along. Judy Chicago began making work in response to land art in the late 1960s. Her dry ice fireworks and atmospheres performances offered an alternative ephemeral engagement with the land. The Nevada Museum of Art recently acquired this archive and is debuting it for the first time. The desert has always attracted mischief makers. Those artists and dreamers who see and think differently, who aim to experiment in hopes of changing the world. High Desert Test Sites in Joshua Tree, California has offered artists this creative testing ground for over two decades. Rose B. Simpson's monumental earthen figures ascend from the gallery floor in her exhibition, The Four. Commissioned and recently acquired by the Nevada Museum of Art, their overwhelming presence reminds us all that land art and the land itself is more than just the earth beneath our feet. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Claire Munoz, and I am the Charles N. Matthewson Senior Director of Education at the Nevada Museum of Art. I thank you all for being here this evening and for continuing to join us as we progress through the art and environment season. Before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Nevada Museum of Art is located in the Great Basin on the occupied territories of Indigenous people. The state of Nevada consists of 27 federally recognized tribes from four nations, the Numu, Northern Paiute, the Newe, Western Shoshone, the Washishu, Washoe, and the Nuwu, Southern Paiute. We acknowledge that more can be done to further research and integrate the stories of indigenous people and cultures into the history of land art and into our collective knowledge of the lands of this place. We're fortunate to call many artists and leaders in the Numu, Newe, Washishu, and Nuwu communities our friends and collaborators, and we welcome those of you who are joining us here today. This evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rose B. Simpson. Rose Simpson is a mixed media artist whose work addresses the emotional and existential impacts of our collective humanity. Her work involves ceramic sculpture, attire, performance, and even custom cars. Simpson lives and works on the Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico. She has a BFA from the University of New Mexico and an MFA from Rhode Island School of Design. She also has an MA in Creative Writing from the Institute of American Indian Arts. Rose has had solo shows at the Wheelwright Museum of the American Indian in Santa Fe, at Pomona College of College Museum of Art in Claremont, at Colorado State University, and at SCAD Museum of Art in Savannah. She also has work at the University of New Mexico Art Museum. Her work is in the permanent collections of the Denver Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Portland Art Museum at Prince, and at Princeton University. She's also at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. With support from the Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts and Six Talents Foundation, the Nevada Museum of Art recently commissioned Rose to create a new body of work for a solo exhibition. This exhibition, as you saw in the video, is currently on view at the museum through April 2022 and is titled Rose B. Simpson, The Four. It includes four monumental earthen figures of varying sizes that appear to ascend from the gallery floor. It's our great pleasure to announce that the four was recently acquired by the Nevada Museum of Art. 
In addition to the acquisition of the four, the museum has had the opportunity to work with Rose over the past year and a half to bring her vision of the transformance, a performance supported generously by Via Art Fund to fruition. The transformance was realized last Saturday in Las Vegas as part of the 2021 art and environment season and was supported with great collaboration from artists and activists Fawn Douglas, the Las Vegas Paiute Tribal Community, as well as Nuru Art and Activism Studios. I want to take the moment to thank Fawn and all of the incredible women who participated last week in the transformance for their engagement and their support. I'm happy to share that for those of you who were not able to witness the transformance last Saturday, it was documented and will be shared in February when we ask Rose to return for a virtual program where she and her collaborators will share their reflection on that experience. We'll be sharing with you updates on that program as we get closer to the February date. With that, I would like to ask Rose to join me for her presentation. We hope to have time at the end of the program for Q&A, so please do utilize the chat or that Q&A function. Hey, Rose. Hi, Claire. Nice to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you, too. I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off, and if you want to start sharing, um, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be a part of this conversation. I'm grateful for everyone who has logged on to continue this conversation and who will in the future. I'm grateful for the Nevada Museum of Art for all of their work to support me and to bring me into uh, this conversation and all the multifaceted ways that they have. Um, and obviously I have incredible support um, through Jessica Silverman Gallery and um, you know, my community, my family, and those who love and support me. I'm here to talk about, um, I've been, I've been really, this is a really fun uh, engagement that I am about to get into because I've been thinking about this for a year and it has been changing and transforming, but I'm, um, it's exciting to finally have this moment to really um, delve into and, and talk about this. Um, this, this conversation has been circling sort of the periphery of my, of my lived experience this last year, and, and, it's, and it's exciting to finally get to this place. Um, and so this, this is titled Clay, Place in Cultural Survival, um, and I'm Rose. So what I wanted to start with was um, the, um, my context. So behind, I believe behind every, every um, perspective is a story and it's important to understand that sort of background or that foundation. This photograph is of um, Santa Clara Pueblo, which is um, my home. <laughs> and this was uh, Santa Clara Pueblo in the late 1800s. Um, and it's, a, it's always interesting to look back at these old photos um, and compare it to, you know, sort of the life we live now. And knowing that I'm of a place, but I'm also my experience of it is very different than my ancestors. Um, even understanding that their experience sort of still lives on in my um, in my DNA, or my uh, genetic memory. Hmm. So <laughs> I'm gonna start with um, my mother. Actually, my mother is Roxanne Swenzel. Um, and I think we're, we're going to circle this concept of motherhood. Um, and I'm going to start with, with the earth that birthed me. Um, and uh, she um, raised my brother and I here in the canyon of Santa Clara Pueblo, where I'm, where I'm zooming in from. Um, and on the left is the, the tool shed that my great grandmother let my mom live in and the army tent that my uncle, that my mom had, that she lived in as she built the house that we now live in, or that she raised us in and she lives in to this day. It's a two-story adobe structure that she made. Um, in this photo, she's in her early 20s, maybe 21, 22, 23 years old, and she was already building a home for her children and to start a, a, a future and invest in a place for her babies. She's an artist, a sculptor, um, 
the piece on the left is the large, larger than life figurative piece that's in bronze. The one on the right is a small, uh, maybe two foot tall um, ceramic uh, mother who is, is who's uh, has this. She's a storyteller, and the figures are falling from the pot on her head. She supported us um, with her art, but also through farming and cultural preservation. In the 80s, she started a nonprofit organization called Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute. And um, this organization was based on um, the teachings of permaculture, which is the, the study of sustainable living systems and applied agriculture, to um, cultural preservation. So cultural preservation being, if we remember how we um, interacted with the land um, historically, um, because, because of our heuristic knowledge and, and spiritual relationship with a place that we already know how to live sustainably in, in our environment. And so on, by uh, in preserving the culture itself, we're educating uh, uh, ourselves and our future, uh, are re-educating ourselves on how to um, reignite and reinvigorate our relationship with our sustenance and our nourishment. And that's not just farming or building, that's also spiritual practices and belief systems. My father um, grew up, is of European ancestry, grew up in um, Annapolis, Maryland, and he was an artist. He went to school at the Kansas City Art Institute as a sculptor in wood and metal. Um, and he moved to New Mexico and builds boats. And the boat on the right you see is the the wooden boat that he built when I was a kid and I spent my, su my summers when I hung out with him uh, sailing in the reservoirs of northern New Mexico in this tiny dory. Um, and, the, and the boat on the left is one he just finished and launched in the uh, San Francisco Bay area. Um, from my dad, uh, my relationship with my dad, I inherited a lot of uh, perspectives of I'll get to that. <laughs> I've inherited a lot of perspectives that that challenged my my main experience of life that I spent more time with my mom. And because of that, um, my experience was mostly based in the Pueblo. But because of my perspective of having um, time away from the Pueblo with my father and his family, um, that I think when you see something and you get some perspective on something, it builds um, a deeper relationship to that. I also grew up in Española, New Mexico, which is the town that's adjacent to our uh, Santa Clara Pueblo. It's sandwiched between two reservations. And Española, New Mexico is the lowrider capital of the world. It's also the heroin capital of the world. Um, but it is a, a community that built um, a strong relationship to relational aesthetics through car culture, um, and through applied spirituality in that car culture, actually, um, to create these vessels of empowerment um, and cultural pride that, that became, you know, iconic and also became um, very much um, a mode of empowerment for our community. Um, being directly adjacent to this culture, um, you know, influenced me greatly. And lots of ways that I, I didn't quite understand until later. Again, when you get perspective, you can look back and see how that affected you. Um, I attended the Santa Fe Indian School for high school, which is a, um, an Indian boarding school, right about the time, a little, little after the tribes actually took over the federal boarding school and started um, running it ourselves. Um, but during that time, I was taking uh, started using my creative process. So this is, these drawings were done in like eight, uh, ninth or 10th grade, um, where I was relating my experience of, of, um, of an indigenous identity with that of youth culture of the late 90s of the area and sort of how we can intermingle those experiences or how do we validate or, or honor um, the dichotomies of existence that, 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 you know, that experience sort of entails. Um, and because of that, I've uh, really um, investigated in different types of expression. Um, and, and some of those types of expression are, are, are really based in survival. 
Um, so talking about similar to sort of the low rider experience that lots of times people um, depend on aesthetic experience or expression in order to um, maintain um, our passion for being alive. And sometimes that, that comes out in ways that, you know, aren't socially acceptable because, or, or weren't at the time, um, you know, because of, of, of fear of change in youth cultures, etc. I also um, grew up with uh, sort of embedded in the in the native arts community. So um, because my mother was an artist, my stepdad was Diego Romero from Cochiti Pueblo. Um, I was exposed to a community of artistic expression. And so, you know, my mother was building work in clay, uh, figurative work in clay, and my stepdad was building, was doing pottery in clay, and then um, painting sort of contemporary imagery um, that were social commentary as well into those pots. Um, and so, you know, watching this happen, this a neural pathway that this is, this is absolutely possible that in your life you can really use the creative process to, um, to, to navigate and uh, explore sort of the experience you're having and also to communicate with others about what that looks like and what that means. Um, Nora Naranjo Morris is my grandmother's younger sister um, and, and watching her, you know, she's also from my tribe and she's pushed a lot of boundaries aesthetically and her work has been incredibly influential to me. Um, and also, you know, she did figurative clay work, she's done installation, she's done architectural work, um, and she's also done um, some things that one might consider land arts or large installation. Um, Virgil Ortiz taking um, from Cochiti Pueblo, taking um, traditional pottery styles and um, turning them figurative, building commentary on our on our on our very contemporary lived experience, but also projecting sort of a, a concept of empowerment into the future with some of his concepts and fashion, et cetera. Um, and not only that sort of contemporary experience, but I've also been influenced greatly by, you know, um, the fact that a lot of my family were um, educators and um, scholars. Um, and so I spent a lot of time learning about our history and about our, our story of our, of our um, experience, experience of being indigenous people in the Pueblo and Southwest. And as, as a descendants of ancestral Pueblo and people living in our ancestral homelands. Um, and also, you know, navigating um, cultural, you know, not, not just genocide, but the loss of culture, assimilation, um, and also seeing how the arts processes which which became in lots of ways our only our mode of sustenance um being close to santa fe uh, arts expression became a mode of you know of of survival and, and economic survival in a post-colonial world and understanding where you know the concepts of western art and and, and applied creativity and spiritual aesthetic, relation, relational aesthetics um, sort of began and sustained. Um, and where that was appropriate, where it wasn't, where, where we put our energy um, towards intention. Um, watching uh, how and learning how different tribes and communities express themselves differently. So this is sort of um, Margaret Tafoya was someone I called Ka'ohum, and she was um, very influential in um, sort of building the Santa Clara style of, of, of deeply incised um, black pottery, so a uh, carbon reduction pottery style, which was um, very traditional to our, our community. And, and I look at this pottery and it reminds me very much of sort of an essence or an energy that comes from my community. And I know this because this is my home <laughs> and where I live and where I, where I continue to choose to be. Um, and it tells me, it tells a story that that aesthetic tells a story of an experience. Not only that, but the clay itself 
coming from this area has different properties and because of the different properties of the clay it's going to express itself differently on the left the photos of my mother and my grandmother plastering the house my mom um, built for my grandma that's actually next door here uh, my grandmother uh, rena swenzel is a philosopher um, and also you know uh she was an architect but also she she had her phd um in american studies and she spoke she she was wonderful at speaking about sort of her perspective on the indigenous experience and and um she was able to define something that she had experienced um in transition of the western world enveloping a world that she knew she was able to um it really defined that with her words in ways that that were uh, vital to sort of the understanding and relationship that was built between anthropologists and archaeologists and indigenous people but i think that because i saw my grandmother and her sisters and brothers um, express themselves so eloquently from a place of deep searching their experience of life was pretty uh, intense so their uh their depth of investigation sort of conjured up an, a really amazing um intentionality and in investigation of uh, and finding answers for their experience and because of that i feel um i had the privilege of 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 hearing a lot of conversation and, and being around a lot of introspective and mm, experiences of investigation that I think were really vital. Um, and because of this, I started seeing from bringing in concepts of permaculture, from bringing in concepts of, of um, post-colonial people um, in this day and age. Um, so what I'm going to go to is my personal quest and how I've used um, my experience and that multifaceted perspective that I was given from, you know, a very um, unique experience of growing up that I'm finding more and more. When you're a kid, you don't know it's unique until you leave and you realize that, you know, um, the experience that I had was not um, one that many people uh, will experience from, from the fact that I was there in the Pueblo to experiencing life um, being bilocal with my uh, father's family and and having perspective of that that difference to um, having living in in a community of artists um, to being in in a world of permaculture um, and also having uh, existing in an indigenous context a primarily indigenous context as a as a white passing person of color and having access into spaces and conversations that uh, I might not have otherwise because of all that. Um, and and it, that's none of that is at a loss to me. Mm. So I am a sculptor. And I, you know, in permaculture, there's concepts of zones and that we are navigating an experience in relationship to um, understanding sustainability through um, sort of um, seeing the world as almost this um, this this nesting bowls idea, and oftentimes I was caught by you know the idea that we're 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 engaging with a world that's sort of further than ourselves, and and we're objectifying and building concepts without looking deep within ourselves about how. You know what our very initial and 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 critical role is in the influence that we have on everything around us when we focus on the deeply deeply personal and intimate um and so because i was able to um you know i watched my mom build um, figures in clay ever since i was a little kid and i saw her support our family with them um, it wasn't a big neural pathway to build to um, engage in that I can build, I can also build um, figurative ceramic work to navigate that role that our, our zone zero or negative one, the part that's 
that's really deeply inside of ourselves, um, where we can start to heal and adjust that in order to make lasting change um, on our bigger environment. Uh, and so um, I, I spent a lot of time building an investigation in ceramics and, and finding out how deeply personal I can make that because as personal as I could make it, the more accessible it could be, the more specific in a sense, uh, culturally specific, I found the more uh, exclusive it would be. Um, and then the, the more abstract it was um, also made it inaccessible. And I was always trying to find that point in my work that made it accessible uh, enough that, that it wouldn't be necessarily objectified. Um, because objectification seemed to be one of the main problems um, that I had experienced from um, gender to culture to the objectification of, ob of the world around us in the way that we, we turned it into a resource that, that was only ours for the taking. Um, so the figure before was actually, I'm gonna back up, was um, I started throwing the clay till it was very thin and building with it in that way um, to sort of force myself in into, into, into an intuitive relationship with the clay. Um, and in that, trying to find that deep humanity in the process itself. The crafting of it was this moment of, of connection and awareness of our creative spark, not just the creative um, process, but also that the intentionality that then moves down our arms and out our hands and into the world. Um, and if I could create space for that, um, it could be you know, uh, actually reach things. This this piece is about sort of a threshold or, or getting through to the other side. Um, and also I could use, use my work to build conversation. I made this piece um, and it's called To Be Pueblo. Um, it's actually in the collection of the Portland Art Museum. And um, I did this in graduate school because I was struggling with some of the exotification and objectification that I was feeling around my cultural identity, which was one of the reasons I went to uh, the Rhode Island School of Design was I wanted to be in a space where I was anonymous and I wasn't um, sort of understood or, or built, uh, external identities built um, around, you know, my family, <laughs> my place in this and the context of northern New Mexico. Um, and so this piece sort of, I was trying to see how I could conjure sort of the energy of an experience without um, giving away too much information. But a lot of my work, um, a lot of my works, which are in clay and intentionally in clay, because um, I really believe um, in the fact that matter can hear, can listen. And when we're in, uh, creating intentionally, that matter is listening to us. Um, and because clay um, in its raw form has water in it, that that water is actually incredibly, um, uh, it, it's, it's incredibly influenced by our energetic state and intention, um, as opposed to say wood or metal or plastic, um, different kinds of materials, um, I feel, uh, have a different um, conductive force um, of our intention. And so I, I continue to choose clay because I feel like it, it inherently listens in a way and it documents that moment of listening. Um, and so when I'm working in clay, I'm building a relationship. And these pieces are hollow and the hollow, when they're fired, they become these vessels. They're these vessels similar to the ones we eat out of, or the ones we live in, or the ones we drive, um, that are also listening to us. So that conversation is continues to happen. And I create these pieces to go out into the world to build that conversation and to continue um, reminding of that moment of, of, of conscious awareness. And I continue to return to specific methodologies of working or concepts because I need it. <laughs> and if I've found anything, it's that I can identify the parts in myself 
that feel unhealthy or sick or make really unconscious or speedy movements or choices. And from those places, uh, I can understand and have compassion for the parts of humanity that choose um, destructive things. And so I build this work and I do these things very intentionally to try and heal myself and to learn about new processes of being or ways of being in the world. Um, this is a photo of an installation that just closed at um, the Kinderhook School in New York. Um, and I feel like um, some of these uh, materials that I choose to use and the processes and the ways that I choose to put them together are more about listening to what wants to be said rather than dominating that or knowing uh, um, or having some sort of agenda. Uh, based on sort of a conceptual or you know you go you get your master's degree you have a lot of words and a lot of concepts and a lot of you know movements and such that you that you reference and and i like to try and empty them out and i like to try and empty them out and start listening and say what needs to go into the world and what needs to be said and how can i be a tool for that to be shared and a lot of my work um has transitioned um i feel from a very reactive state and i guess all of my work is still reaction reactive to um an, an experience that i feel is 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 unhealthy um is headed for brick wall our, our collective humanity and the decisions we're making collectively are are incredibly destructive um culturally um and also ecologically right because we're we're sharing uh, an experience on this planet and a lot of our, our um, lack of, of consciousness and internalness is causing, um, is going to cause some hard times. <laughs> and I have shifted my process, becoming a parent, a parent, a mother, <laughs> a caregiver to a small child that I am all of a sudden way more invested in a future and what that looks like and what that sounds like and what that is for um, this being that I love dearly. And, and how do we empower ourselves and how do we find our strength, um, especially for people who have been, um, who have been dealt some pretty hard cards um, historically and every day have to navigate that uh, intensity of an existence in, in, in this modern, postmodern world, post-apocalyptic post world. Uh, how, do we, how do we pick ourselves up and continue? Um, and sometimes that's the least we can do. And so a lot of my work is about finding that moment of empowerment. And if it isn't for you know, myself to, to wake up in the morning and to keep going, it's for others uh, in my similar position or for for others to understand that there are people that are needing to stand up and make it through the day and stay alive in order to do this work. Mm. And so um, I've been often considering, uh, because of my understanding of Indigenous aesthetics or, or my own experience of Indigenous aesthetics being so much based on um, everyday aesthetics. It's not, uh, art isn't something that exists over there that becomes an experience that you go find or is a privilege to be in your home or privilege to access because it's in a space that is, you know, existing in privilege. Um, that I'm, I'm working towards building relational aesthetic experiences so that we can remind that everything that we do through the day is also um, art. And if we start making it special in that way, then our decisions become uh, much more um, educated. And that education is not necessarily Western education, but a sensory education of what do we hear? What do we feel? Where are we internally? Um, and so if we can build those moments of, of, of experience, of heightened sensibility, that we can then be, begin to make um, more informed decisions. So um, I built this, or I didn't, I, I, re, I rebuilt 
this uh, 1985 Chevy El Camino. I customized it um, to, like I showed you earlier, the pottery of my area um, is, is black and a carbon reduction. And I, I painted this car, this vessel, this postmodern vessel uh, in, in the methodology to, to um, simulate one of our pottery um, pieces as it's a vessel of consciousness. It's a piece of medicine for empowerment. Um, and I've used, I've used this car to um, get myself from point A to point B um, and to have moments of, of introspection and growth and excitement and life uh, a vibrancy of life that's higher, <clears throat> excuse me, but I've also um, used this car to take up space, and taking up space has been really important, um, and it started um, with um, taking um, an experience of incredible disempowerment, or people that have experienced or will experience in this po in this world that we live in, um, incredible disempowerment, and then be brave enough to stand in in what looks like power, what what feels like strength, what feels like um, a moment of aesthetic um, precision, <laughs> um, and so I started creating these experiences where it was very simple. Um, rules in a sense like we were just going to walk and we we're going to drive this car down the street and take up space or we're going to interact with the with the space in a very uh a conscious way mm, where nothing is scripted it's 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 about um actually standing in presence and taking up space and in in a moment that creates an aesthetic experience um and from that i feel like i learned a lot about um, you know, changing from putting a piece of art out there and hoping that I can change from it to becoming that and standing in that and seeing how that feels. I just got back from this, uh, like Claire was talking about transformance um, in Las Vegas, Nevada with Fonda Gliss at, at um, the new art studio. And we slowed down and we took up space and I'm still trying to process that. Um, and I look forward to getting to the point where I can really deeply investigate this moment. But I was creating a space uh, <clears throat> where we listened deeper and we felt stronger. And we um, some of the realities of our existence were sort of uh, a forced experience um, in a time where we very, very easily like to jump over the things that are hard to feel. And I think that a lot of our decisions are made um, from places that that don't uh, that avoid some difficulty. And so, sort of, for myself, standing in an uncomfort or fear or strength or even a strength that I'm scared of of standing in or or standing with a type of strength, I think was my biggest uh, takeaway from this. I look forward to talking more about this, but this was the most recent um, uh, experiment into uh, that sort of aesthetic experience. I often think about um, when every single day <laughs> the world is confrontational on a million different levels, that, that, that if we choose to feel, what we will feel can really hurt, especially if um, your experience has been one of subjugation through colonization, etc. cetera, um, that there's a lot of things that are incredibly painful. Um, and this, this series that I did that was first installed at Savannah College of Art and Design and is now uh, installed at Mass MoCA in, um, in in the Appalachian Mountains, where these eight foot tall figures leaned against the glass. And these are ceramic figures and the glass is fragile and their forehead is against it. And there's this threshold and it's waiting to break. And it's waiting for that moment where, where there's, there's answers, there's freedom, there's movement, there's um, 
something changes uh and and that tension is super important to me to sort of dig into and be with and express um and also how do we empower ourselves in these moments of collapse of deep heartbreak so um as i was making these figures uh a little girl from my tribe went missing and four days later they found her body in the river that runs uh, close to my studio, about a quarter mile from my studio. And I, um, something in me broke that we live in a lot of denial because there's so many hard things to feel that we don't want to feel that we don't even go there. So why would we go there if we cannot, right? So if we can numb those, those experiences or that information as much as possible that we don't ever look at it or feel it. And I made these pieces and they're river girls. And it was about uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and trying to give prayer uh, and strength to an experience um, and also the experience of making the pieces themselves become a healing um, and purging process um, where the feelings aren't avoided but they're actually um, invested um, and I and uh, with some help and the photographer Kate Russell we took them down to the river and put them in the water. And so I think often about going back to land. And I think about um, the, our, the belief that I was raised that the land below our feet is our mother. This is our mother. And she's a woman. And she gave birth to us all. And, and when we have man camps, uh, extracting oil etc from this earth and in those man camps the the exploitation and abuse of women and especially indigenous women um is real it's a real thing that's happening and it is really really uh a, a metaphor for our relationship to the land itself um we are now finding <laughs> that there's mass graves in all these Indian schools across the, the continent. Mm. And um, these are things that we, we would much rather, you know, not think about, but it's these children that were um, in deep relationship to the land. And when you take them away from their parents, you take them away from their mothers at a young age, you start breaking that connection with your lineage, with your, uh, with the with the source of all nurturing. And when you break that lineage, there's a resentment, and then there becomes, you know, Westernization becomes uh, about um, disrespecting that lineage, disrespecting that source, um, and that being the mother. I was driving out of Las Vegas, Nevada. A few days ago and I drove through uh, Moapa Valley and I was headed home. I was headed home. I was like, I'm going home. I'm going from Southern Paiute ancestral uh, turf territory, homelands, uh, where this um, hideous city was built. <laughs> it's, a, it's a front to all this, uh, the senses constantly to um, Santa Clara Pueblo where there's this valley where, where we are so lucky to have our uh, entire, uh, you know, water uh, source, the whole, the, our, our creek goes all the way to the mountains and we have this, right? This is our reservation and we're very proud. And I drove through, uh, you know, a sign, it was Moapa, I think, Valley Indian Reservation. And it was the first time in my 38 years that it hit me so hard it felt like a punch in the gut that, that the indigenous people of this nation have been stuffed into these little squares and everything else was just taken, sucked up. And just the fact that indigenous people were put on these reserves, kind of like national parks, and we were just these wild animals that are sort of stuffed into these little boxes. Um, it, it had never hit me uh, as so painful. And I cried, I cried. And it had to be me looking at someone else's land 
because I've always seen my own reservation as kind of this protective spot where we're safe and this is where we all live and it's just like the last thing we have and we're grateful to have it and we're protected there but it I didn't see it I didn't I hadn't felt the heartbreak in the way that I needed to and then I drove drove home through our ancestral homelands and and saw dams and I saw uh chain uh you know, Walmarts, and I saw, you know, people living in poverty, and I saw land being torn up, and I saw, uh, you know, the unconsciousness of Western colonization and extractive mentality on a place that, that we have had a deep and long relationship with, and it was, it was heavy, it was really hard and, and dark. And I think about our relationship to that. And it's not necessarily, you know, when, when we talk about what land arts is specifically um, being this sort of conceptual investigation into, um, or has been. And I feel like everything we do at this point is, is going to affect our land, is going to affect this place that we live is going to affect each other, that we are on a precipice. All of us, all the time, right now. And everything we do is in conversation to place and with place and with um, our mother that's beneath our feet. And, and at this point, uh, we are not going on flights of fancy, right? Like, we're, it, it feels like there's a lot of you know, playing around with what art is that we have to get very serious. And I'm trying my best to find ways to infiltrate and, you know, hack those moments of decision so that we can make more informed and healthier decisions about ourselves and, and our relationship to all things and starting with ourselves. And when we can start, uh, building a relationship to our world around us that is um, that is informed by a different kind of relationship and a different kind of listening and a different kind of feeling what something feels like within our being um, that then we can begin to look at things differently and to make decisions that are uh, more informed um, and informed being sensory. And I hope that, you know, every time that I go into the studio and every time that I work and every time that I wake up and I'm struggling, that I have those, the capacity to sit. And when I work, I'm investing that intention into my work. And I'm trying to build for myself that capacity of sensory awareness so that I can start healing and that from that healing place, I can begin to make true lasting change for the world. And not, not on a conceptual level, not on a Western educational or institutional level on a on a level that goes from the tiniest cell to the to the biggest um boom of manifestation and what does that look like and how can we begin to find our roles in that place and how do we begin to see art as what already is art as our relationship to it art is the way that we're standing there art is in the way that we visit uh each other our own um, the ways that we interact with ourselves and those moments when we stand uh, seen by land, seen by the trees and the rocks and the, and the earth below our feet watching us. And when we notice that we're in conversation and that, you know, um, we have to be held accountable for that constant uh, communication. So these are some of the photos that are on the wall um, at the Nevada Museum of Art at the installation of the four. And there are moments, all the photos are of moments where I walked out into um, outside <laughs> and I made a moment of intentionality and I and there was a moment of witness. And the witness not just being myself of place, but of the place of me and that moment of uh accountability and responsibility and consciousness of that. 
And every single time that I went out with that intentionality of that prayer, you know, it changed me. And as much as it was, you know, intended for a show at Nevada Museum of Art in a room that's this big with these ideas that mostly it was about, and the most important part of that was how it changed me and how that changing and that intentional changing of myself can ripple out into the world and make and make lasting change. Um, and we keep we keep the we keep the earth on our mind <laughs> and we value that and we honor that and every intention that we have is about our relationship to space and to place and and these beings are coming and similar to um, the dimensions that we are constantly um, navigating. Um, you know, we are earth beings and we're in relationship to those earth beings. We are watching and we are being watched. And how do we um, be responsible with those places and those spaces and those decisions that we're making constantly for ourselves and for the future as well? Here's that piece uh, installed the four directions, the pieces of ground from outside the museum, and then the photographs on the wall, the, the layers of building and growing and coming into this time where we are of and no longer using of the land, of the earth, of our mother. So that we can remember how to interact with our land. This is this is um, the canyon that I grew up in, that my ancestors lived in for generations and generations and um, into the past. And, and I hope to build uh, the value system that changes the way I interact with the world, changes the way I speak about it, the way I represent it, and how that's, how that's shown, and how we can work together to make that lasting change, where we our voice becomes our prayer, becomes what we see in the world, becomes reality. So that our values can change and become something much more uh, fulfilling. This is uh, corn my mom grew on the left and these are pots she made on the right. Um, grateful to, to be in her orbit to this day and to be a part of, of her intentionality. And this is my daughter walking in our ancestral homelands. And this is um, a drawing of myself holding myself or myself holding my daughter or myself as the baby being held in the most high uh, blessing of our world itself with all the elements. It's all the layers of what's important and how we need to remember to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. That was great. Um, I think that this was the exact right placement of this program at the very tail end of the season where we're looking and examining land art past, present, and futures. Um, we opened the season by looking at the 50-year tradition of land art, uh, Michael Heiser, Walter De Maria, Robert Smithson, um, and really moved into the ways that different artists have uh, interacted with the land, um, including the work of Patricia, Patricia Johansson, Mary Miss, Judy Chicago, Colleen Smith, Justin Favela, um, Raven Chacon, and uh, Chanupa Hanska Luger, and, um, and I know that I'm missing some in that lineup, but I think um, this was the perfect way to end the season, and I thank you for your participation in it. I also am grateful for the opportunity to have gotten to work with you very closely over the past year and a half, um, which has been a real wonderful experience and a moment of reflection for me. Um, earlier, you shared with us uh, some of your familiar lineage, your ancestral history, um, contemporary influences of other artists, and your deep connection to Santa Clara Pueblo um, and the land, which is really realized in your practice. I always admire that you're very um, reflective of the people who have been a part of your life and your history, and you are very open about sharing their influence on you. Um, you also talked a little bit about the influence of disempowerment, um, the way that you move into empowerment and how you live and we live in a post-colonial world. 
Um, and I have heard from you many times that you say that your, your true desire is to create a uh, true and lasting change in the world to, to really do something. Um, so I think, you know, I would like to conclude today's question, today's conversation by asking you um, if you can share a little bit about how your work and process might influence the ways in which we as observers, as witnesses, as participants um, might shift the way we move in the world and interact with the land. I think that one of the most um, influential ways that I stay sort of present and grounded in those places is that when I approach something, uh, I'll, I'll just use the land itself. Like when we're building a relationship with land is separate than other, all the things that I feel like when we objectify the land to start with, <laughs> um, that becomes um, problematic. But I feel like when we give voice to the land when we allow it to speak for itself um and when we you know um we ask first if we ever ask we're when we understand that we're constant guests no matter what and that we are you know entering into spaces uh in the way that you would enter into someone's house because it is you know um the way that we should be acting right like I always feel like we have to remember that we're being watched and that we enter into those spaces as if we're being watched and if we need to be held accountable for the way we act and that um oftentimes we forget we go through our world in, in a sense of in increasing and often really intense entitlement and we enter into uh, um you know, our, our ideas and our plans with this sense of like, um, I can do whatever I want <laughs> uh, in, a, in, a, in a way of, of being not very conscious of what we're affecting. Um, and I know, I know I do it. And it's often that I have to stop and like, you know, listen to what might be watching me or listen to any kind of messages that might be coming. Um, you know, for instance, um, my stepdad is is helping me build a new studio and we and he's breaking ground and I before I left on my trip I went and sat there and I asked the ground if it wanted me there before we ever like made any plans I, I sat there and I listened really intentionally to and with no expectation to see what there was you know and I feel like I have I hold judgments of like, if we don't recycle, there's certain things that you need to do that are that are expectations. Um, and we don't always know what's right. And I felt incredible guilt for building a house, right? Or building a place. And I felt like it was sort of getting under my skin. But when I sat there and listened, I felt this real deep excitement that the land did want me there. And it, it brought me to tears because it wasn't what I expected to hear out of my guilt, right? And so sometimes it was, it's surprising um, what we might find. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, if we walk in this world with, with intention, you know, with um, a conscious request for permission and consent, um, and really take the words that you've shared with us to heart. Uh, you know, again, just in appreciation for us to end the season on this note. Um, I've talked to you a little bit in the past about finding the call to action. So that is, I guess, what I would leave all of our participants with today is to find the call to action from, from Rose's conversation today and from your experience with the season. Um, Rose, thank you so much for joining me today. We have some nice comments in the chat of gratitude. Um, I certainly am, and grateful for my experience with you and I know the museum is. Um, I look forward to working with you in the future and hearing from you in February. I can't wait to see how you and um, all of the collaborators will reflect on the transformance and certainly those who witnessed it, including myself, will have a lot to um, consider and ponder 
for participating. To our uh, audience joining us today, thank you for being here. Thank you for staying with us through the season. Um, we invite you to return tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for the concluding conversation with Lucy Lepard. Um, and again, that is at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So thank you so much for joining us. Everybody have a wonderful evening um, and we hope to see you in the morning. Thanks, Rose. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.